is Megan Hutchison, and I will be talking today about the process for building my rough. When I set out to make this rough, I wanted to make a 1575 style rough identical to the one that the Earl of Leicester is wearing in this portrait, but proportionate to my model. The first step was to devise a pattern for my rough. I looked at the picture of the Earl of Leicester and tried to figure out some proportions for the rough that I could take to my model. I discovered that for every quarter of the rough, there were seven peaks of pleats, so seven times the pleats went up. I also discovered that the ruff was about the same width from the chin and about the same height of the ruffle as the height of the Earl's nose, so from the bottom of his nose to the bottom of his eyebrows. I then took a photograph of my model with a scale in front of his face and was able to use this to determine how tall and how wide the ruffle needed to be based on the proportions of his face. From this, I concluded that the ruff should be approximately 6 centimeters tall and approximately 6 centimeters out from his face. Based on the size of the ruffle and the number of ruffles around the head, which was approximately 28 given that there were 7 per quarter, I figured that I would need 336 centimeters of fabric. I also measured my model's neck. His neck is 15 inches around. This is what would become the basis for the neckband part of my ruff. After this, it was time to get the fabric. Going off the advice from my GA for this class, I decided to get some cotton batiste fabric for the ruffle part of the ruff itself. What was most important was that it was a lightweight, natural fabric. Linen, lawn, cambric, or holland would have been used in the 1600s. However, this is quite expensive to acquire now, and in some cases even impossible, because the hand looms have been replaced by machine looms, and that kind of weave is just not possible to attain anymore. I chose a slightly heavier linen for the neckband, as it would need to be sturdier. I chose both the linen and the cotton in natural or ivory sorts of colors, in the 1570s, cotton thread would probably have been used as the thread of choice to sew the garment together. However, since I could not find this, I chose a light-colored, very fine polyester thread that matched my fabric in color. The next step was washing my fabric. I knew that my ruff, eventually, when I made it, was going to need it to be washed by hand, so I hand-washed both the linen and the cotton in warm water in my shower and hung them up to dry. This is the linen, I forgot to get video of the cotton. The next step was to cut out my ruffle fabric. I made a rough pattern of some spare fabric I had just to make sure that I got the width right. I took the six centimeters width that I wanted and added an extra centimeter on so that I would have enough for a hem. I then cut the fabric out after pinning the pattern to the fabric and placed a rough hem on the outside edge. This was supposed to have been a hand-rolled, very tiny hem, as seen in some of Janet Arnold's patterns of fashion rough patterns. However, I didn't have the time to make it entirely by hand. I would have preferred to make it entirely by hand, not just for authenticity's sake, but also because I'm more comfortable with actual hand sewing than a sewing machine. Once I had the long edge of the fabric hemmed, I stitched the strips together using a whip stitch at the selvages, as you can see here. I realized as I was doing it that this probably should have been done before the hem was made, as there were some occasional discrepancies with how wide the hem was. If I was going to make this again, I would definitely do that first. Then it was time to pleat the ruffle. Now here is where I experienced most of my errors. I had several different pleating schemes, and most of them didn't work. When I first attempted to pleat the ruff, I gathered the ruffle strip into approximate pleats, basically the height that I figured they should be given my previous measurements, uh, and stitched them together at the top. This didn't work. The ruff was too floppy and the bottom wasn't supported correctly, so I had to get rid of that. Then I decided to measure it. So I measured it approximately 5 inches, which is 
again what it looked like it was supposed to be the width of when I had them gathered by hand. However, this didn't work either. When I had gathered them five inches apart, it seemed unsteady. So I placed another round of stitches, of gathering stitches, in between these, and that just completely threw off the sizing. So I had to take those out and start again, again. Then I actually went and measured it. Every 12 centimeters, I placed a mark and then gathered. I placed two rows of stitches so that the top would be more well supported. However, when this was finished, while it was about the correct size, it was pointed in the wrong direction. There were flaps up at the end instead of down, which is what I wanted. So I had to take it out and do it again. By this time, there were lots and lots of little pencil marks on my fabric that I desperately wanted to get rid of. So I took a soft white eraser to them, based on some advice that I found on the internet, and that turned out to work out much better than it would have if I had decided to go straight to washing it. So I went back and looked at my sources, and found in my historical reenactors blog that uh, there was a little bit of a trick to this. And the trick was to include a small pleat at the top of each pleat, sort of inwards, and that would make sure that the pleats gathered nicely and poofed out at the edges. So I measured along every 12 centimeters, which is what the distance was between the two roughs, placed a mark, placed another couple marks beside it, stitched it all together, and realized I had done it wrong again. Once again, the ends were pointing up instead of down, so I took it all apart, made marks every 12 centimeters, made marks every 12 centimeters between those marks on the bottom side so that I could also gather the bottom of the rough, made one centimeter marks on either side of those 12 centimeter marks, pleated it all together, and finally it gathered into something that was nice. Next, I had to make the neckband. I made a rough pattern out of a piece of paper following my measurements of my model's neck. I added some space onto the ends for breathing room and some extra space as well for seam allowances. I then pinned it to my fabric, cut it out, and made marks along the important intersections with tailor's tacks, little, uh, little colored threads inserted into the fabric. I'm not sure how period accurate this is. I think that it was probably more likely that the marks would have been done with chalk if they were done at all. Once I got the fabric cut out, I remeasured it against my model's neck and realized that I had made it too short. So I had to go back, lengthen the pattern, do all that cutting out again, and finally it was the correct size. I folded it over so that the wrong sides were together, and also so that it would be sturdier, and stitched around the edges using a back stitch. The sources that I have did not specify whether it was a back stitch or a running stitch used to ensure that it was closed properly. However, both of these methods were used at the time, and I wanted to use back stitch to ensure that it would be as sturdy as I could make it. I left the ends of the rough neckband open so that I could turn it right side out. I turned it right side out, poked in the corners, pinned the seam allowances together, and used it as the basis for making my ruffle. Most sources I had recommended at this point to pin the ruffle onto the neckband. However, I found out that when I started trying to pin individual pleats, it wound up being too lumpy and cluttered. So, I pinned the ruffle to the neckband at the quarters instead. This meant that I was still able to move the ruffle around and make sure that the pleats were pinned exactly the way that I wanted them. Once I had attached the pleats to the band, however, I didn't realize that it was slightly too short. So I took some of the scrap fabric I had left over for making the ruffle, I made a small hem on the outer edge, and I whip-stitched it to the rest of the ruffle just as I had whip-stitched the other strips together. I used a whip-stitch combined with knotting on the backside to tie the pleats to the neckband. I did this to the top side of the pleats first, pinning the bottom side to the neckband as I went along, just to keep it in place. Then I went back and sewed on the bottom side of the neckband. This part especially really gave me an appreciation of the amount of time 
effort and skill it required to build one of these ruffs. This part took me the better portion of two days, and I was only making one of the smaller kinds of ruffs. I can't imagine how long it would have taken with the larger cartwheel ruffs, which had much smaller, finer pleats, and many more of them. When I finally had all of the pleats sewn onto the neckband, I turned my attention to the closing. I was using hook and eye closures and wanted to insert them into the neckband itself. So I opened up the seam allowances and sewed them onto the inside before closing the seam allowances with an overhand stitch. This locked the hook and eye closures neatly inside the neckband. Then it was time for starching. I made an approximation of my model's neck out of a two liter plastic bottle wrapped in a dish towel. I also put down some scrap linen that I had from the first time I made the neckband and made it wrong so that if any of the colors in the dish towel decided to bleed out into my fabric that they probably wouldn't bleed too far. I wrapped the ruff around this bottle and pinned it to the washcloth. Then it was time for more adventures in trial and error, this time as I tried to make handmade starch. Laundry starch has a lot of different ingredients, but you can make simple starch by combining cornstarch and water. However, it is the method which is difficult. I had seen several recipes that called for boiling the water and then adding the starch. I had also seen a few recipes that called for just putting the starch in with cold water and shaking it up to dissolve. I tried the first one, boiling the water and then putting in the starch, and wound up with a slightly thickened liquid with a bunch of goopy gluey globs at the bottom. Not helpful. So instead, I tried the cold method. In my spray bottle, I shook up a tablespoon of cornstarch with a cup of water. This was about the proportion that I had read online, in basically all of the recipes. I propped open the pleats of my ruff with pieces of paper towel wrapped in tape. Then I sprayed them with water and then the starch mixture. The water was to make sure that the starch would dissolve into the rough itself and not just stick to the surface. The paper towel served as a substitute for the hot poking irons used to preserve the shape of the ruffs. I left the starch to dry overnight and looked at it in the morning. Unfortunately, the pleats were much softer than I had expected. So I had to go back to the drawing board and look at how to make the starch better. I realized that what I did wrong the first time when I made hot starch was I heated the liquid first and then put cold starch into it. This causes the starch to just stick to itself instead of dissolving in the water. So I shook up starch with cold water and then heated it up. This formed a much thicker substance, which I used a paintbrush to paint onto each pleat on the rough. This was much closer to the actual method of painting starch onto ruffs in the 15 and 1600s. I left this to dry again, and when I came back, it was much stiffer and much better. Finally, the ruff was done and ready to wear. There was, however, an issue in using paper towel as the medium of choice to prop open the pleats. This being that paper towel is porous and some of the starch had soaked through and in fact the paper towel was now sticking to the rough fabric itself. What I had to do was gently pry them apart from the rough fabric. There is evidence seen in Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 4 that this did happen sometimes in the 15 and 1600s. <laughs> As you can see in the portrait of the Earl of Leicester, the Earl of Leicester has a beard, so the ruff pops open a little bit at the chin. He is also wearing a very high neck doublet, so I instructed my model, who naturally has a beard, to wear a high necked leather jacket, which mimicked the neck of the doublet in that it propped up the ruff around his head to cup his face. <laughs> this project, I have discovered the immense time, effort, and skill it takes to make one of these incredible historical garments. Mm -hmm.